Welcome. We'll get started in just a moment. If you're just joining us, welcome. We'll get started in one more minute. Hello and good afternoon. My name is Rachel Baker, Forest Program Director for Washington Conservation Action. Welcome to the seventh annual Carbon Friendly Forestry Conference. Although we miss seeing your lovely faces in person, we're excited to have you here. We're deeply grateful you've chosen to spend this time with us, learning and sharing your knowledge. And we're excited to hear from a range of speakers on interesting topics over the next few weeks, including stewardship by small forest landowners, carbon offset markets, new analysis on both carbon and non-carbon benefits of forest management, and climate smart wood products and supply chains. And we hope to see many of you in person for our happy hour on Thursday, November 16th, to unpack what we've heard and continue the dialogue in real time. As you all know by now, we've remained virtual for this year, but added a third day of programming. We look forward to gathering these first three Wednesday afternoons in November. As we get started, it would be great for all of you in the audience to share your name and any organizational affiliation in the chat so everyone can get a sense of who else is here with us. Before we officially begin today, it is our commitment as Washington Conservation Action to acknowledge the land that we occupy. Here in Seattle, we're on the unceded traditional lands of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the ancestral land of the Suquamish, Muckleshoot, and Duwamish. We respectfully acknowledge and honor all indigenous communities, past, present, and future. We express our gratitude as guests and thank the original and current stewards of this land. We would not be here without their guardianship and connection to the earth. We know that a land acknowledgement is the bare minimum. We encourage all of you to go beyond simply learning about the original stewards and inhabitants, but also to commit to action like consulting and collaborating with tribal communities giving land back to tribes, 
protecting the environment and salmon and the tribal cultures that depend on them. It means electing officials and judges that understand tribal sovereignty, supporting native-led priorities such as land sovereignty, upholding treaty and land rights, and much more. The well-being of indigenous peoples are born of their homelands, and that makes these lands and waters precious. All of us have the responsibility to treat them with the respect and care they deserve and to steward them carefully for the next generation. Please do your part. Thank you. I'm now pleased to share the topics for the day. Today's theme is small forest landowners, carbon markets, and carbon offsets. Last year, we heard that attendees were interested in more carbon-friendly forestry conference sessions featuring small forest landowners and content relevant to small for forest landowners. We hope this day of programming is a start. Please know that we do take your feedback to heart as we plan each year's conference. We have three great presentations planned for today with time for discussion after each. We'll kick off at 1.15 with Richard and Deborah Pine of O'Neill Pine Company and their talk, A Small Forest Landowner's Perspective on Sustainability Opportunities and Carbon Challenges. At 2.05, Sandy Letzing and David Bugney will share their expertise in a talk entitled Forest Carbon Works and Small Forest Landowner Experiences in Carbon Markets. Then at 3.05, we have an in-depth analysis of current carbon markets in our final talk of the day, Carbon Markets for Forest Management, State of the Market presented by Julius Passe and Jeremy Koslowski from the Climate Trust. We'll close out our first session with a brief look at what's queued up for weeks two and three. We'll be in this same Zoom room together all afternoon, which will remain open during the short breaks between sessions. You're welcome to remain logged in during those breaks. Okay, so without further ado, let's get the ball rolling. Uh, today, we're honored to have Washington Conservation Action CEO, Alyssa Macy, here to open the conference. Alyssa, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Atukti Wigwa. My name is Alyssa Macy, and I'm the CEO of Washington Conservation Action, our state's leading legislative and political voice in Washington's environmental community mobilizing for action. Welcome to our seventh annual Carbon Friendly Forestry Conference. Some of you may remember our first years of the Carbon Friendly Forestry Conference under our former organization name, Washington Environmental Council. In January of 2023, the combined 95 plus year power and experience of Washington Environmental Council and Washington conservation voters unified under one new name, Washington Conservation Action. Our new name reflects our organization's place of influence, aligning our critical role in the modern conservation movement and our ability to bring people and our communities together to act on behalf of their health and the environment. Washington Conservation Action works with people like you to protect people and nature as one. All of us are grateful that you were able to take time out of your busy schedules and spend it with us in exciting conversations about carbon-friendly forestry over the next three weeks. We look forward to the same enriching and inspiring conversations critical to the well-being of communities across Washington related to our forests and an environmental undergoing the effects of relentless planet warming pollution. Over the seven years we've hosted this conference, a lot has changed. As the effects of the climate crisis have intensified, so too has the innovation, the collaboration, and the efforts to find new solutions and incorporate the traditional ecological solutions understood by tribes since time immemorial. What hasn't changed is that every Washingtonian deserves access to clean air and water, healthy lands and forests, strong environmental protections, abundant nature, responsive elected officials, a clean energy economy, and a thriving democracy. This year's conference is not happening in a vacuum. Our forests are one piece of our collective Washington identity. They are the economic lifeblood of many small and rural communities, and their impact and importance to our very way of life is unchanged. But wildfires, a drier planet, and overexploiting these ecosystems threaten this precious resource more intensely each year. As a Native woman, a citizen of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, Oregon, I understand this, and I see the trees and our forests as a living part of our community. They are our relatives. 
And holding that fundamental truth has driven us all at Washington Conservation Action to think differently about forest management and how to fight for healthy forests. Thankfully, as part of the planning for this conference, we're always reminded of the wide ranging efforts and experts, people from all walks of life who are working together towards a future that recognizes the value of forests, not just to our identity, but as climate solutions. The speakers we have this year are tribal government staff, landowners, environmental leaders, local electeds, mill owners, private sector representatives, green building experts, and motivated citizens. We'll hear about the different ways that science, traditional ecological knowledge, markets, forest management certification, and old fashioned relationships come together, committed and driving meaningful progress for the future. We can't wait to share all these stories and work with you. I'm reminded of a quote from the Nobel Prize winning Indian poet, Rabindra Tagore, the one who plants trees, knowing that he will never sit in their shade, has at least started to understand the meaning of life. And of course, all of us connected to forestry maybe understand the meaning of life, sure. Um, but what it brings up for me is that so much of our work in forestry is planning, or dreaming of a future that we will never experience. The work to conserve mature and old growth forests or planting new trees now all rests on a principle of selflessness for future generations. And I truly believe everyone here holds this true too. We build for a future that is healthy and one which we will never experience firsthand, but our children and our future generations will, and they deserve it. Our hope for this conference is that it plants new ideas, provides a new connection, or sprouts a new conversation with everyone here and with us, and that it gives you hope for our future because we believe we'll find new ways for a carbon-friendly forestry. We look so forward to the dialogue that continues beyond the three days of the conference. And again, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for joining us and welcoming us into the space, Alyssa. And with that, we'll get started with our first session, a small forest landowner's perspective on sustainability opportunities and carbon challenges. I will hand it over to Katie Fields, our forest and communities program manager to introduce the presentation. Hello and welcome to the first session of the seventh Carbon Friendly Forestry Conference. As Rachel mentioned, this is a small forest landowner's perspective on sustainability opportunities and carbon challenges. My name is Katie Fields, and as Rachel mentioned, I'm the Forest and Communities Program Manager at Washington Conservation Action. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. If you'd like to submit any questions to the speakers, please use the Q&A feature, which you can access in your toolbar at the bottom of your webinar screen. We will be sorting through the questions and presenting them to the speakers at the end of today's presentation. You can also use the chat box to send messages, but keep in mind that any messages will be visible to all attendees. Lastly, a reminder that this session will be recorded and shared with all participants after the conference. All right, let's get started. Forest managers balance a number of different objectives and values to achieve a range of benefits, maintaining a healthy ecosystem, reducing negative environmental impacts, ensuring supply of timber products, keeping their businesses solvent, and preparing for an uncertain climate future. Perhaps no one is more keenly aware of the shifts in forest systems, both ecological and economic, than small forest landowners. As our climate crisis worsens and demand for sustainably produced wood products grows, small forest landowners are at the front line of emerging challenges and novel opportunities to improve ecological and economic outcomes in the forests. We begin our session today with small forest landowners who have been in the business for decades and are willing to share their journey and some of the ways they're adapting and managing for future forests. Now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our two speakers. First, we have Deborah Pine, who is board chair and corporate secretary at O'Neill Pine Company. And we also have Richard Pine, who is president at O'Neill Pine Company. O'Neill Pine Company is a third generation, sustainably managed, FSC certified family timber business. And with that, I'll turn it over to them. Thank you.
Right. Okay, well, good afternoon. Um, I am Deborah Pine. And as we heard before, everyone has a story. And it's how we share our lives and our hopes and our dreams and how we can impact our world. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to let us share a little bit about our story and what we do and how that leads to our connection with carbon systems. So first off, um, some history. As O'Neill Pine Company, we are a small landowner, a family owned timber business, a segmented tree farm and forest managers. Our story begins around 1912, when the first generation, my grandfather, Robert Harold O'Neill, as a college educated engineer, could not find any work. And as the story goes, he pawned his watch to buy the only available job from an employment agency. It turned out to be a job at a sawmill. And that began his journey of livelihood from the forest. With an entrepreneurial spirit, he went on from that introduction over the years to own and manage several wood products related businesses, some breaking even, but most failing altogether. Finally, 77 years ago in October, 1946, at this bright old age of 57, with a rebound in his entrepreneurial spirit, he decided yet again to take another risk on a business venture, this time in lumber brokering with Alan C. Hemphill. And this time it was a winner. Here, as Hemphill O'Neill Company, he began to create and build a legacy for his descendants that they too could enjoy the fruits and the passion of entrepreneurial efforts through family ownership and management. Four years later in 1950, the next generation, my father, Robert Hugh O'Neill, joined the company and it expanded and thrived by adding timberland and sawmills. In 1977, the third generation, my brother and here a much younger me, began to work in the business. Let's move forward quickly 15 years later and the Hip Hill family has moved on. Depression in the lumber business dissolves the mills and there's discussion of a corporate split off that would allow a now third generation with growing families the opportunity to continue our own individual companies following the legacy by our grandfather and father. As of today, our part of that split as O'Neill Pine Company, as I married and hired Richard Pine, we manage as the third generation of that legacy. It is 99.6% female owned by the third generation, myself, fourth generation, our two daughters, and even the fifth generation, our precious grandchildren. Now, with some understanding of our family history and ownership, what does our segmented tree farm forest consist of and where is it? We have 45 different forested parcels ranging in size from the small of 10 acres to the large of 214 acres. They stand adjacent to other timber ownership, farms and fields, and some housing developments. They're sort of sandwiched between the urban and the rural landscape. These parcels add up to a total of 2,247 acres. They're located within five miles to the east and five miles to the west along a 25 mile stretch of the I-5 corridor within Lewis and Thirsty Thurston counties of Southwest Washington. In this collection of many multi-aged forests, some are composed predominantly of Douglas fir, some are slightly mixed with red alder and western red cedar, and some we have purposefully tried to vary even more with mixing and interplanting 
with all these species and ponderosa pine when appropriate after harvest and thinning. As with um, west side temperate forests, there's also a host of other trees, wild cherry, aspen, hemlock, big maple, cascara. I've even seen some spruce. Um, they uh, make the forest lovely and beautiful. Um, the only things that we try to discourage are the Himalayan blackberries and scotch broom, which are not native to the Western forest. Um, and sometimes the big leaf maple, although a wonderful native can cause a lot of shade when you're trying to um, plant uh, new trees. Although it played out a little differently before OPC acquired them, we now believe we are responsible for the health and the welfare of the land, the trees, the alternative forest products, the wildlife, water, air, as well as ourselves and our neighbors. We want to be good stewards of these resources. They nourish our souls and we want to preserve the enchantment of the forest that is where stewardship certification came into play for O'Neill Pine Company. It aligns with our values. All of our forested land has been certified by the Forest Stewardship Council since the year 2000. It is a set of guidelines and monitored responsibilities that help us manage and maximize our stewardship values and our triple bottom line as a company. The triple bottom line, economic, environmental, and social. Economic, is it good for us? Well, this forestry is our livelihood. So we manage in a way to at least make a modest living. Environmental, is it good for the land? We manage for a variety of species, health of the land and trees, sustainability of the forest, the wildlife, alternative forest products, and fire suppression. Is it social? Is it good for others? We manage to respect indigenous rights, treat our neighbors well through accommodation, information, and recreational access. Not long ago, some of our neighbors presented us with this lovely pine needle basket as a result of us allowing them to collect pine needles off of our property. And it shows a wonderful connection between nature and um, being able to use its products to create beautiful pieces of artwork. We also treat our employees well with flexible schedules, autonomous work, and paid charitable time, generally practicing good citizenship. In 2019, we were awarded the Washington State Tree Farm of the Year. It was a chance to showcase our efforts in stewardship and share our story alongside other Washington State tree farmers. This huge sign is actually posted on one of our properties alongside a county road. I grew up in a family business whose livelihood came from owning nature. That's a concept I'm still trying to wrap my head around even today. Unlike the first and second generations of my grandfather and my father, the, when the passion lay more in the entrepreneurial management and expansion and of the skills of successful business, as the third generation, that passion has morphed into a deeper connection with the responsibility for the land and the trees in the pursuit of that triple bottom line through the joy and the gift of owning nature. 
always remembering that we have today, but what we have today is the result of the hard work, passion, and generosity of our forebears. My father felt it was so important for the following generations to understand and appreciate that legacy that started with Alan Hemphill and Robert Hare O'Neill. So he commissioned a book of Hemphill O'Neill company history so that we can always remember the legacy that came before us. So now I'm going to have Richard continue the part of our story that journeys into the carbon systems conversation. We try to practice sustainable forest practices. First of all, we had to come up with a definition. We thought that would be easy, but we since found out a lot of people have different de definitions of what sustainable forest practices are. For us, the definition was, was easy, that we took track of what living, standing, marketable trees we received from the second generation. And our responsibility is to provide that amount or more of the same living, standing, marketable trees to the next generation when they're ready to assume the ownership of the company. To do that, we maintain a 100-year plan for timber operations. That means we put on paper what we think we're going to harvest, what we're going to thin, what we're going to plant for the next 100 years. But we're not naive enough to think that's, that's what's actually going to happen. Every year, we take into account the market conditions, the health of the forest, and what's going on in our lives. And that's what's determining what, what's going to be worked on that, that year. Flexibility has become a key, but the 100-year plan forces us to think in generations rather than just what's happening this year and next. Monitoring is a key part of what we do. When we plant trees, we commit to being out there the next three years for reprod cruises, every year after that until year 10, and then every five years. We want to see what's going on on the timberlands. And adaptive management has become very important because we've learned that what happened once in one section of the timberlands isn't going to necessarily happen again. As much as we try to force forestry into science, we recognize there's a lot of art. Impressed upon us by, by foresters from Germany was the importance of taking care of the soil. That we watch out carefully for, for soil compaction, and we care a lot about leaving large woody debris out on the forest land to get more nutrients into the soil. Trees come and go, but the soil is the asset that stays. Part of forest, sustainable forest practices to us is also being a good neighbor and a good citizen, and hopefully being able to continue to practice long-term sustainable forestry. And we believe that a, a sustainable forest is profitable, but not greedy. I've shown this particular slide to other people and they've been somewhat surprised at the results. The bottom line for us is 22 cents on the dollar. So when we harvest, and this was a thinning operation, the, the ratios are different for a clear cut. For a thinning operation, uh, logging is our biggest cost at 26. Transportation at this time was 10. I think it's probably gone up a percentage notch. That management is not just not management forever, it's just management of that particular logging operation. And you can, you can read the other white boxes going around the pie chart, but I draw your attention to, to four of the white boxes on the left that taxes are a considerable part of our operations. 22 cents on the dollar is what we look for to sustain our forestry operations and the company. When we were first asked to participate in this conference, um, 
Our first question was, should we really be speaking at a carbon-friendly conference? We've uh, no stranger to the topic. We've gone to a lot of conferences, read a lot of papers, but so far, nothing has really worked for us. Uh, searching through our files, things go back to 1999. Uh, you may recognize some of the names in that document on the right, which was presented from the state of Oregon uh, to talk about what resources were available for the developing markets of carbon dioxide offsets, as they were referred to back then. You may recognize some of the people. You, you may be some of the people that are on that list. These are other, other companies that we worked with that may be familiar to you. Woodlands Carbon, New Force, Ecotrust. And I've always liked that pie chart in the lower right-hand corner of this particular slide. We all like to talk about trees as being the way to sequester carbon. But, you know, carbon in a sustainable forest is stored in other things besides trees. So we come to our issues with carbon. Uh, additionality is the key. Most carbon systems reward uh, carbon sequestered after a particular date, maybe the Kyoto Protocols, maybe another date, but after some date. There are few carbon systems that reward three generations of sustainable forest practices that produce good carbon management. We don't think that's quite right. We belong to both the Small wind, woodlanders, Woodland Owners Association and the Large Woodland Owners Association in Washington. In one, we're a big fish in a small pond. In the other, we're a small fish in a big pond. But for carbon and scale, uh, we are almost always told that we're too small to play or just maybe on the borderline, maybe we should try to see if it works. Uh, scale has been a problem for us. Now, maybe we're at this conference going to hear something different, and we are open to learning new ideas. And then I mentioned confusion. Um, we have heard uh, sincere presentations that talk about doing 100% tree cruises on our forest. We don't do 100% tree cruise on anything. Um, there's also, they also talked about doing soil sampling, not just digging in the ground, but uh, taking home samples into our oven, baking them, and coming out with a, an equation that would give us an idea of what carbon we had available. Not likely to happen. Um, annual audits, every three-year audits, every 10-year audits, not quite sure how that works. Or maybe we skip all that and just compare our forest locate by location to other known or accepted to know content of, for, of carbon in maybe federal forests. Maybe that's a better way to go. And frankly, what is a gigaton? <laughs> and, uh, and why can't we spell tons with an S instead of N-E-S? Someday I'll maybe figure that one out. <laughs> The fourth area is commitment. Our family business believes one generation of family management should not bind the next generation. 100-year commitments don't work well for us. But still, despite all that, we have hope. What gives us that hope? We, we have a hope that eventually systems will start to reward generations of good management rather than, as we put them, carbon come latelys. We think maybe an American tree farm system might have a, a system that might work, but they seem stuck on the East Coast with eight, in just eight states and don't seem to have a firm plan to share it with us Westerners. We hope that'll change. But primarily what gives us hope is that when we look at this conference and see the people involved, we see good people. 
And we think good people eventually come up with good solutions. As much as we have been through, we are still learning. We're still open to new ideas. We have hope. Thank you so much, Deborah Richard. We really appreciate having the opportunity to hear from your perspective. And um, you can hear both about the successes and the challenges that you've encountered. We have a lot to learn from your experiences and to consider going forward. So we have about 20 minutes for questions. So I'll kick us off with the first one. Uh, what is the biggest piece of advice you would give to other smallholders who are interested in adopting more sustainable forest practices? I, I think the sustainable forest practices start with the triple bottom line that Deborah talked about. Many of us are trained specifically uh, to only use financial analysis to make business decisions. It's by far the easiest and quantifiable. It is difficult, but a key step uh, to realize we're not turning a blind eye to the financial part, but instead we're also considering and valuing environmental and social standards. That's a real hard step to take, but I think that's what makes it easier uh, to adopt um, sustainable forest practices. Thank you, Richard. Next question. One of the key elements of carbon markets is the idea of permanence, which involves committing to decades of maintaining sustainable practices. Recognizing that your children and grandchildren may or may not wish to continue with the company, what opportunities do you see for continuing to advance the values you hold within a broader community? Let's start on that. Well, hopefully we've instilled within our, our children. Um, we, we did have them out on the land from an early age and they were out working in our forests. Um, they know that this legacy of forest land has come from their uh, grandparents. And so I think seeing that connection, um, we hope is instilled that value in them that this is something that we would love to have continued in perpetuity. Um, and hopefully that would influence how they approach it. I, I contribute to that. I, I think we need to see a paradigm shift um, away from the, the fish and forest type of requirements that, uh, that tell us what not to do and assume presumably buying things forever but that forever is kind of an illusion. It's, it's forever until it changes. And that's hard, hard to work with. Incentives that help people make good decisions today, uh, I think are maybe a better way to go. After every final harvest uh, on a property, there should be a free choice to replant and continue in forestry or to clear, subdivide, and build houses. Or making that replant choice, choosing the bottom, triple bottom line choices should be recognized as additionality and should be rewarded. Maybe we need to switch from a, uh, an illusion of permanence and forever to a smaller reward that's earned annually rather than a big reward that's uh, permanent. Thank you both. We have another question coming in from Savannah Reed. This question is, what is it about, what is it about the American tree farm system that gives you hope? The, uh, the tree farm system, as we understand it, and, and admittedly, this is just by reading the the, the verbiage um, has less barriers for entry. They, they, they seem to be part of that, that comparison to um, existing stands in order to establish carbon base. And the commitment that's required as we understand it by American Tree Farm 
is not the hundred year in the hundred years. It's a much shorter commitment. Those things uh, are are attractive to us and maybe a way to make this work. But again, they're stuck in eight states on the East Coast, and that's not much help to us poor folks out of here in Washington and Oregon. Thank you, Rich. And our next question gets at that 100 year question as well. So we have from Dar Darcy Nonemacher. Thank you for sharing your real experience. Can you elaborate more on the disconnect between your 100 year management plan and the 100 year condition and carbon market opportunities? Well, I, I, I'd i hoped that uh, I, I, I realized that I was saying the 100 year and, and hoped it wouldn't seem like too much of a conflict, but I, I hope to emphasize that in our management plan, flexibility is the key. And that, uh, we're not naive enough to think that uh, if we've learned anything over the last hundred years of our company's history and forestry's history, it's that things change. Um, and so so that's that's what we built our forestry plan, a hundred year forestry plan to be uh, on paper and thinking in terms of generations, but flexible enough to change every year. Whereas if you're signing a document and Putting into our hundred-year uh, change in behavior, uh, that's that's a different story and not flexible, and I would contend not realistic with the thing the way things change in this world. And our own land land ownership, remember, is within five miles either side of the I five corridor, so. Instead of owning timberland that's out near the mountains and whatever, where a change is less likely to happen, where our ownership is, change is much more likely to happen. And that's where the flexibility, I think, comes in for us. I think I think FSC did a pretty good job of addressing that with us and uh, that concern and, and saying that uh, we have this amount of timber timber acres uh, it may not always be those same timber acres, but we're always going to have those timber acres. That's that's a more flexible approach. Sort of a follow-up question or a question in a similar vein from Paula Swedeen. The 100-year commitment comes from the physics of carbon dioxide persistence in the atmosphere. If selling an offset allows someone to else to continue to emit, the entity selling offsets need to keep CO2 out of the atmosphere. It's understandable that the length is daunting and frustrating, but what other system might work for you to give the dynamics of CO2 in the atmosphere? Well, I, before I was in timber, I was in insurance. And, uh, and in, in insurance, you think in terms of the law of log, large numbers. Um, little bits of premium can allow an insurance company to pay out a large claim. So in that same way of thinking, um, if you have a not large number of people managing for carbon, but instead of on a forever 100 year basis, they're managing instead on an annual basis, you, in, you, you still are aggregating a large, the, the large number of people to provide that physical goal that he's asking about of sequestering carbon. It may not be the same geographic location, but it overall in the aggregate can, can provide the same function. The next question we have is coming from Robert Reidel. The question is, uh, first of all, thank you so much for sharing your perspective about, about brush practices. What mechanisms do you use to manage it? What mechanisms do you use to manage conflicting needs across the triple bottom lines? The and managing how how do we deal with managing the triple bottom line if things are conflicting? That's a value question that everybody faces, I think. Um, <clears throat> it's it's the same. Same type of um, mechanisms of, <laughs> we've used in, in raising a family. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the, the needs of the, of the parents are not always the needs the, of the, uh, the kids and the and now we throw in grandkids into there and, and the, they're, they're kind of the, the dominant players. but it, it's trying to 
instead of winning um, and seeing winning as one side, one point of view coming out on top, such as the financial. Yeah, we, we made more money this year than we've made in the last five years. It's instead of one win, we look to maximize how, how much we can win in all three areas of the triple bottom line. Um, it's sometimes helpful to um, try to put a, a numeric value, uh, but I, th I think the real temptation, because it's so easy, is to try to put a dollar value on, um, on the environment and a dollar value on the, uh, the social parts. I don't think that's fair. I think that's using the home team, giving too much of a home team advantage to the financial, the, the business area. I think if you want to try to put a numeric quantifier on it, pick something that's external to all three and try to try to come up with a more neutral, neutral. Well, that hasn't been the most helpful to us. It's better just to try to balance out like a family does and try to find the, the maximized solution with no one, no one coming out with a, a pure win. the analogy thank you uh the next question we have is coming from holly haley the question is are you involved in the washington small forest landowner carbon working group to help inform how carbon markets might work for us here in washington we're not personally involved but we are involved through washington farm forestry association and we're also through um, uh, washington forest protection association Uh, next question, what do you wish the conservation community knew about the unique challenges you face as small forest landowners? And what do you wish larger scale industrial timber companies knew? Well, the conservation community, um, uh, there, there are a lot of very reasonable people in the conservation community. There, there are some, well, there's some in both of those communities that are less reasonable maybe. And maybe towards that less reasonable side, I'd say the real enemy is steel, concrete, plastic, and glass, not timber, and particularly not timber that comes from small forest lands. And for the larger scale uh, industrial timber, um, I, I'd, I'd like them to know how personal our performance and our survival are. We're not funding investors that we'll likely never meet. Those who benefit or lose based on our performance are the same ones we sit down with at Thanksgiving. It's Kylie, it's Carrie. Owen and Mila. <laughs> it's it's personal. Mm -hmm. And it's it's the memory of, of Harold too. And uh and really remembering who came before. Thank you. Um, changing gears a little bit, you have forest lands spread across 45 different properties. What are the enabling conditions that allow you to manage across such a dispersed geography? Um, well, we spend as much time up there as we can. Um, we love to be out in the woods and, and working, but um, we are, uh, you know, we're getting to that, uh, age of, uh, aging ourselves out of, of being able to do the work, uh, being in the mid and very late sixties and our consulting, uh, timber, um, person is older than we are. So, um, you know, it's a question that we constantly think about, of uh, how are we going to get the the work done and and manage um <clears throat> we can't do it ourselves so we do hire contractors and employees and listen to uh how people um their experiences and how they might do things different than, than we do um but we do the best we can Uh, Timothy Leadingham asks, uh, NCX has tried a one-year harvest delay standard, but has now given up before 
has now given up because buyers are skeptical of the permits and additionality. Do you have anything to say regarding that situation? I, I, I don't, I don't uh, personally know that situation, but I, I hope one, one effort that didn't work, um, doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, rule out future efforts that work. I, I, I'm glad to see some consideration given that way, and I'm glad that came up at this meeting to know that um, it, it is being tried. Thanks, and I think that this may be our last question, although if folks still have a question too they'd like to throw into the Q&A, we would be happy to, to have that addressed. Uh, but it looks like the last question for now is, what are some of the practices you use on your tree farm to promote long-term soil health? since soil is even more important for the long-term health of the timber standing on it? Well, our certification um, actually has uh, requirements for um, ensuring the health of the soil. Um, we have requirements for the amount of down wood that we, is left on the land. Um, the fact that we don't use, or it's the restricted use of herbicides. Um, what else? That we uh, we try to designate uh, travel roads and skid roads mm -hmm. so that uh, we keep the heavier equipment on uh, on limited limited space so we're in not doing the soil compaction as mm -hmm. much and and being careful about the type of equipment that comes onto the forest lands um, during wet times we have restrictions we have a a three-page uh, addendum that goes on every logging contract. One of the provisions in there is during wet times, uh, uh, they're restricted in how much rutting that uh, rubber-tired skidders can can create. And if they are creating too much, they need to shut down. Um, it, it is hard to protect the soil, but it's very important to do so. The, the down wood and the, uh, the slop and scatter method is frustrating, I think, to, to us sometimes trying to walk through it, but um, uh, yeah, I think it's good for the soil. Thanks, it looks like we did have a couple more questions come in. So the next one is, would the prospect of potential higher carbon prices, potentially through Washington State's forest carbon protocol, potentially make a difference? I'll, I'll never say never, but uh, as far as, the difference in um, in a hundred year commitment, probably not. Um, that and and the balance between wanting to be an active harvesting and thinking that's better for the social triple bottom line um, to be an active harvesting entity and not just a carbon entity. I think both of the, those have to go together. But that that being said, higher prices. And the availability of prices at all to a, a smaller company like us would be welcome. Thank you. All right, looks like this may be the last one. Do you try to optimize atmospheric carbon removals by your ecosystems as part of your management strategy? Hmm. Could you say that again or, or rephrase yeah. that? Yeah. Do you try to optimize carbon removal from the atmosphere by your ecosystems as part of your management strategy? Well, as I hear the question, the, the best thing we can do for carbon renewal is, is be growing trees. Because they're, they're as in my mind, the best, best instrument we have for removing carbon. So the, the yes, yes, we do, because that's what, what we, we think is part of what we, we do, uh, but if we maximized, uh, some people might say maximizing was never cutting a tree. And we also think that would be a mistake too. That would be one part of the environmental bottom line disregarding the other two bottom line parts. Well, part of what we tend to do is overplant. So maybe in that that sense, we're, we're increasing, um, but it's, it's we find that sometimes we end up that with that creating not good health for the forest either. So um, it's there's a lot of, of that's the artwork in forest management is you have to 
you know, try to see what works, try to see what's working for other people, um, experiment a little here, do that, try this, that, and the other thing. And and here again, that what we keep hearing is that this 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 is something that we do not um see what happens in the future. You know, we're just doing it now, hoping that it plays out for the best for the, the next generation. We hope that others will sit in that in the shade of that tree that we're planting today. Yeah. <laughs> and that thank we made the right choice. <laughs> well, thank you again so much, Deborah and Richard. And thank you to everyone who has been in the audience asking lots of great questions um, and participating in this session. We do have a little bit of a change. Uh, we will need to go ahead and actually close out the current session to enable closed captioning. And you'll have to reopen uh, when you come back for the next session. So we'll take a quick break to get set up and feel free to get some water or a snack, uh, stretch your legs and plan to be back here at 2.05 for the next session. Thank you very much. <laughs>